Welcome back to the Diesel YouTube channel. I'm Adam and in today's video we're getting back on our 454 stroke engine build series. So in today's part of the series we're going to go ahead and start inspecting a lot of the parts on this engine and going into detail on what parts we need to replace and then also going into detail on assembling the engine and getting it together. So let's go ahead and jump right into the work. So if you haven't seen the last video yet or you just need a refresher on where we left off, um, what we did was basically we got the engine all torn down to the cases here. We actually split the cases and we also went ahead and removed the crankshaft. So we're in a good place here to go ahead and start inspecting the parts and then we can go ahead and start putting things back together. Uh, but what we're gonna start with is we're gonna go ahead and actually inspect these bearings here first. So inspecting your bearings is actually a really easy process. All you need to do is just kind of run your finger on the inside of the race here and make sure it turns nice and loose. Both of these bearings here and actually all the bearings on these cases are actually turning really good. So we know we don't have to replace them. If your bearings are glitching up and they're kind of hard to turn, um, your finger keeps sliding around, then it might be a good sign that you need to replace those bearings. Cause you definitely want to get the cases apart and make sure you replace everything that needs to be replaced. So the next thing that I'll go ahead and do now that I know all the bearings are in good shape is go ahead and I'll look at our oil catch here and I'm just gonna take this off of here and make sure it's all clean. So these oil pickups are definitely something you're gonna wanna check, especially if you've had an engine failure like we did. Um, this actually looks pretty clean. I don't see, I only see one metal shaving on here. So other than that, we're in pretty good shape. If there was a few, uh, just make sure to just rinse them out with some water and then you can go ahead and just throw it back on there. And one last thing I'll mention to you guys about this oil pickup is sometimes, now that we have it out of the way, there's gonna be a good amount of dirt down in here. So you wanna make sure you clean that out because that's just gonna run through your oiling system and wear out your parts much quicker. Okay, so I went ahead and installed the oil pickup and cleaned out some of our dirt and sludge here and also went around and cleaned out um, just other areas in the case and did that as well to the left case. So now we're gonna go ahead, move on and start to inspect our transmission. So when you're inspecting your transmission, it's actually a pretty simple job. Um, you're just gonna make sure it's not dirty. You wanna clean it off and everything. And then you wanna check every tooth on every gear. Just slowly rotate them around and just check every tooth to make sure there's not a chip. And then the last thing you're gonna look at is these dogs right here that engage the gear. I'm um, just gonna wanna make sure they're not rounded or anything. Most of these look pretty good, so I'd say we're good on that front. The only thing I'm really noticing with this transmission is it's actually pretty rusted. Um, so I'm gonna take a steel brush to it, clean up some of that rust. It looks like pretty early stage rust, so I think we should be good. So now that we've looked over transmission, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the shift drum here. Um, this is a pretty rare component that you're gonna need to replace due to damage or anything, uh, but you just wanna make sure you have your pin in. This allows you to do your shifts. And then also you're just gonna check these grooves, make sure they're not worn out. This engine was actually pretty low hours uh, when we tore it apart, it just had that failure. Um, so I'm not surprised that this shift drum looks pretty, pretty new. And then here with our shift fork, um, kind of a similar story. Um, this shift fork actually looks really new. Um, you can still see these pads here are not flush. Sometimes this will be really worn down and flush with the actual fork. And then also you can get some wearing here. Um, how we check this is basically we'll just take a dial caliper and measure it to our engine specifications. So next we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our crankshaft here. This is the damaged one that we got out of the engine, but we're still gonna look at it just so I can show you guys how I would go about inspecting a crankshaft. Okay, so for those of you who are wanting to measure your crankshaft and balance it on your own, um, honestly, for most of you, I'd probably recommend sending it to a professional to get balanced or just replacing it since the price to re replace a crankshaft is honestly sometimes cheaper than getting the tools to perform a crankshaft balance. But uh, for those of you who still want to and really like to do things on your own at home in your shop, we will have a video, um, either one or two videos coming out on actually balancing your crankshaft. So stay tuned for that if that's something you're interested. If not, we're not gonna put it in this video because I figure most of you guys probably are not gonna be doing that. But the things you would wanna measure is your radial run out and we'll definitely talk about that in this other video series. But today I'm gonna show you the main things you'll look at when actually looking over your crankshaft. And the first thing we're gonna take a look at here is the sealing surface where the seal and bearings sit on the crankshaft. If you have grooves that you can feel with your fingertip, you're gonna to need to replace the crankshaft. And then you wanna check both your bearings. This bearing is seized up. You're gonna to wanna to check it. If it wasn't seized up, you wanna check it for up and down play. I can't really move this bearing hardly, um, but you wanna check it for up and down play. Um, side to side plate is gonna be okay though. 
You also want to check the top of the crankshaft where the wrist pin goes. Make sure that's not worn out or damaged at all. And then the final thing you could check is where your cam chain actually rides on the crankshaft here. Make sure that's not worn out. So now that we've inspected everything that we need to go over before we can start putting things back together, just want to let you guys know what a rebuild kit we're using on this engine. So we decided to go with the Wiseco kit. Uh, we just went with this kit because it's going to come with everything we need to go ahead and fix all the issues that we have with this engine. So it's going to come with our crankshaft, main bearings, and then the gaskets and seals we're going to need. So yeah, these kits are quality and I'll put up on the screen along the way which parts came from the kits so you guys can know when you're deciding which parts to purchase. So the first thing we're going to do is actually install our new main bearings. We went ahead, put them in the freezer. We're trying to get them as cold as possible. And then we're going to heat up this area to get it warm enough so the bearings have about a 200 degree difference between the bearings and where they need to pop into here in the case. Uh, that's what I found to be like the magic number that allows the bearings to just pop in there. If you were doing replacing all the bearings, say they were all damaged or you were building a race engine and you wanted to do that, um, that's fine. You just go ahead, remove them, and then you could actually heat the case up in a mini oven all at once to be able to put the bearings in. But in this case, we're just going to heat up the airing or area around the bearing race. If you're wondering at all what I use to check the temperature difference between the case and the bearing, I use a temperature gun. We don't actually sell these, but I'll put a link down below to a good one. All right, so we now have the correct temperature difference between the case and the bearing. So we're going to take two needle nose pliers, and that's the best way to get it centered. And then we'll go ahead and pop the bearing into the case. You're just going to want to make sure it's centered up, and then it should fall right into the case. If it gets stuck part way, you're going to need to take it out and just do it again. Um, that's kind of the pain of doing this if you don't get enough temperature difference. So it's best to err on the hotter side. And we can go ahead and throw in our retaining plates. Just want to make sure to put some blue Loctite on these bolts if your uh, service manual calls for it. And finally, we can go ahead and torque down these bearing retainer bolts. Uh, these are really easy to torque down, especially on this thread pitch. It's about 8 to 10 foot-pounds on most bikes, but definitely check your service manual to confirm for your bike. So a little trick is basically these bolts are punched in by the manufacturer, and you can see the old punch mark on the bolt right here and then on the retaining plate right here. And what I did is I switched the bolts, and that way when I tighten this one down, the ping mark is actually facing away so I can get a new ping mark in here to make sure this bolt stays in place. And when you're actually making these pick marks, they're going to need to be pretty forceful since this metal's pretty hard, and then you're also going to need a pretty sharp pick to do this. And now we're going to go ahead and repeat those same exact steps on this side of the engine. Pretty straightforward, and I do want to mention, if you're using an impact like I am, don't actually tighten down the bolts with it. Just get them nice and just a, maybe a little bit snug, and then take your torque wrench out and finish them off. Really don't want to strip out any heads this far into the engine. If you guys have learned something from these videos up to this point or you're just enjoying them, consider subscribing to the channel and consider giving this video a thumbs up. It really helps us continue to make this educational content. So I'm not going to show myself lubricating all these bearings here, but I do want to stress the point that it's really important to make sure you lubricate everything that's rotating on the engine for initial startup. And now we'll go ahead, remove our output shaft seal and our shift shaft seal, and this will really help us uh, install those shafts so we don't have to worry about pushing them through the seal. So we got our bearings lubricated, so we're going to go ahead and install both of our transmission shafts at the same time. Before I put this one in, I'm just going to make sure to replace the seal right here. So now that we have our new seal onto the output shaft of the transmission, we're going to go ahead and install both the shafts together. You're going to want to make sure they're meshed up exactly how they go into the engine, and if you have any loose washers, you're going to want to make sure you keep track of those and they go in at the proper orientation. This shaft was a little bit stuck on the clearance, we just had to give it a light tap with the mallet. As long as they're going in straight, it's okay to do that. So our transmission is now seated all the way into the engine, and we can next go ahead and install the shift forks. There's going to be a groove right under one of the gears on your transmission. It'll be pretty obvious where the shift fork slides into it. You're going to want to make sure you get the proper orientation of the shift forks and lube them up for initial startup. So now we'll go ahead and install our shift drum. When installing your shift drum, you might have to wiggle your shift forks up and down or just the shift drum up and down to get it to fall into place. Can be a little tricky, but it should go pretty easy for you after a little bit of finessing. And we just want to make sure our transmission shafts are completely lubed for initial startup. 
So next up, we'll go ahead and install our crankshaft into the left side case here. Depending on your service manual will depend what case your crankshaft actually goes into. So make sure to refer to that. On this engine, we're going to put it into the left side bearing. We're going to cool down the crankshaft too. So it should pop right into that bearing. If it doesn't, we can pull it in the rest of the way though. And to cool down this crankshaft, we're going to put it in the freezer, which could cause some condensation. So we're going to use this Bose Shield T9 lubricant to prevent that rusting on the crankshaft. And then the next step is going to be to go up, go ahead and heat this inner race of the bearing. You do want not want to get this inner race too hot, probably around 150 or so degrees, similar to what it would be at operating temperature. And then we can go ahead and evenly try and pop in the crankshaft. You might have to wiggle it around and you can see it popped in there. As we were installing the crankshaft, it did not go far enough into the engine. You can see there's still about a finger width gap between the crankshaft and the crankcase. Um, this is a lot more than you would want, so we're going to go ahead and pull it in the rest of the way. Uh, the heat difference just wasn't great enough between the crankshaft and the bearing, so not a big deal. We'll just pull it in using our Tusk crankcase pulling and installing tool here. Uh, this tool, you'll just thread one piece onto the actual crankshaft, and then um, we're going to attach our pulling rod. Put our two bar stocks evenly across the crankshaft in places that it won't damage the actual uh, cases of the engine. And then we'll go ahead and install the body of the tool. And then we can just slowly tighten down that nut. And we're just going to work this crankshaft on there very slowly. We're not going to go to a final position just yet because we're going to have to set that a little bit later on in the build process. All right, so the crankshaft is now all the way pulled into the left side case. It's not in its final position though. We're gonna have to tweak it a little bit once we get the other case installed and then we can set our crankshaft to crankcase clearance right here with a feeler gauge. But we're gonna hold off on that for now. And then the next step is to actually take this case here and get it all ready to go together. So that includes things like installing all of our dowel pins, um, installing all of our seals and making sure our sealing surface is ready to go. So what we'll go ahead and start off with here is getting our sealing surfaces all ready to seal up. Just want to clean them off before we install the dowel pins into them because then it'll be harder to uh, take our Scotch-Brite and clean around on them. The easiest way I found to do this is just Scotch-Brite. These cases aren't that bad just because they're sealed with a, a chemical bond as opposed to a gasket. But we're just going to go ahead, take the Scotch-Brite around and lightly just remove any surface debris. If you have heavier gasket material, you'll want to get a small scraper and actually get that off and then just lightly hit it with the scotch Brite. And both of our dowel pins had some very light rust on them, so we just remove that real quick with the scotch Brite pad and then we can go ahead and reuse them. And while we're at it, we're going to make sure to put some anti-seize lubricant on both of our dowel pins just because if we ever have to take this engine back apart, um, this will make it a lot easier because the dowels won't rust. And then we also want to make sure to clean out some of that old rust and residue from the dowel, um, the hole where the dowel pin actually sits in. And then finally, we'll just pop the dowel pin into the side of the case where we have everything on and repeat the same steps with the other dowel pin. You could put the dowel pin in the other side case. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to do them all in the same case. And our final dowel pin is actually part of the oiling system, so it has a seal on it that the manufacturer recommends we replace. So we're going to go ahead and throw on that new OEM seal and then actually install the dowel pin right back into the case where it came from. Since this is an oiling one and there was no corrosion, no need for anti-seize. So one of the last things we need to do before we can throw these cases together is remove our oil delivery pipe and replace the three seals on it. The manufacturer recommends we replace these. Um, so we purchased new seals that are OEM quality and we'll go ahead throw those on one at a time just so we don't lose track of which seal goes where. Just keep in mind your engine depending on its oil delivery system may not have a pipe like this that goes in between the crankcases. So if you don't have one just don't worry about this step. But now that we're all completed with throwing these seals on here we'll go ahead and throw the oil delivery pipe back in the engine and we're just one step closer to throwing these cases together. And finally, things are getting exciting here. We're almost ready to throw the cases together. So we're gonna use some Honda Bond high temp gasket sealer that's gonna seal these cases up really nicely. We're gonna do a nice layer of pretty even around all the way on this case and throw this stuff on there. You're not gonna want it much thicker than the tip of a screwdriver. So you really don't need that much. And uh, we'll just go ahead, throw on that even film and throw these cases together. Okay, so we now got our gasket evenly spread onto this case and it's all ready to uh, actually slide onto the left side case now. So we're going to go ahead, I'm just going to start it by hand and then from there I'll take it with the crankshaft removal tool. So 
So as you can see, when we were putting on this right side case here, it actually went on uh, almost all the way. Um, you can see the cases are about quarter or eighth of an inch apart. Um, so in this case, um, really good that this comes on all the way and that's just specific to this engine. Most engines, um, it would stop a lot higher and you'd actually have to use your tool right here to pull it on the rest of the way. In this case, um, the crankshaft is a little bit looser fitting on this engine and that's just because of the design. They actually recommend that you hammer apart the engine. So with like a rubber mallet, you actually hammer the engine to separate it. We use the crankcase splitter and I still recommend if you have a crankcase splitter to just go against the service manual and separate it that way. It's just a little bit easier on all the components and it's just gonna make your life easier in the long run. But from here, they actually, instead of using this tool, um, this tool doesn't line up on this particular crankshaft. On 99% of crankshafts it will, but because this engine is not meant to be put together this way, um, it's not gonna work on this engine. So what I'll have to do is, uh, according to the service manual, they actually recommend that you just thread in um, about five to 10 bolts spread around throughout the engine and then slowly tighten those down to draw the cases together. And as I'm tightening down these bolts, I'm just gonna make sure to do it in a star pattern and about a half to a full turn on each rotation. Uh, we're just gonna do this so we don't get too far ahead with one side of the case and accidentally throw our crankshaft out of balance. All right, so we got both the cases pressed together now, and we're actually gonna call it there for today's video. This video is getting a little bit long, so that's why we're calling it, but we wanted to pack as much information as possible for you guys to reference when you're doing your rebuild. If you enjoyed the, today's part of the series, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing, and I'll catch you guys next time.